So welcome to the Wildlife Trust Tent at Groundswell, the Regenerative Farming Festival, uh, where we've been having sessions over these couple of days, inviting speakers in, having conversations with them to learn more about regenerative agriculture, nature-friendly farming. And I'm delighted that for this next session, I'm joined by Jake Fines from the Holcomb Estate in Norfolk. And Jake, you've been described a little bit today, in fact, in one of the other sessions as landscape recovery royalty, I think. You know, how, how did you end up in this esteemed position? That's what I would love to know. And, and tell us a little bit about your story, how, how you came to be in the position you're doing now, where you end up being called landscape recovery royalty. So my career is a career based on being a practitioner and working in all parts of agriculture, forestry, farming, livestock, haymaking, sugar beet harvesting, game shooting, um, and, you know, started, left school at 16 and went straight and um, uh, worked at Nep Castle while it was still a conventional farm. The, the famous Nep. Um, and then uh, briefly went to Australia, and then I came back and just fell back into, uh, well, went back to Nep, and uh, they kindly... I, I, I moved around the, the different elements and the different sections within the estate, as well as being in the office and learning how, how, that, how you implement uh, long-term decision-making for the welfare to maintain the estate sort of as a whole. Um, and in that period, so a lot of it was then evolved into game shooting, uh, and then I came to Norfolk in 1995 to work on a wild pheasant shoot um, this which, wasn't on the Hol Holcombe Estate? This or? isn't on the Holcombe Estate. No. This is in South Norfolk. Um, and when you're managing a wild pheasant shoot, it's all about ecosystems and uh, invertebrate populations and habitat and structures of habitat to ensure greater productivity. And in that period of time, we had things called set-aside and we had common agricultural policy and everything that I was implemented, trying to implement... I soon discovered that actually farming was holding a significant amount of uh, the nature on the estate back. So I started to um, look at agri-environment was fairly new, and we started to implement agri-environment throughout the estate, to the point actually we were probably the first cluster group because every single farm, the, the seven farms on the estate and also two neighbouring farms, I, I effectively implemented habitat change and creation within the farm landscape. Um, so uh, to the point that I started to get recognised and I started to bring children onto the estate, so with the, with the country trust, uh, and then we had uh, the, um, the referendum to, to, for us to exit Europe. We had the 25-year environment plan. So I thought, I've got to up my game and I need to speak to government, I need to speak to organisations like the Wildlife Trust but also the RSPB, National Trust, and the NFU and the CLA, um, to the point that I uh, was then asked to be on the landscape review with Julian Glover, which was uh, published in uh, the autumn of 2019. Uh, and then I got a bit of publicity on what I was doing. Mark Cocker wrote some very nice things about what I was doing in his book, Our Place. Um, and then uh, Lord Lester rang me up and said, we're looking at creating a position which was effectively a senior manager uh, um, implementing all of the conservation elements within the Holcomb Estate. So the Holcomb Estate is 25,000 acres on the North Norfolk coast. Uh, at that point, Holcomb had just received Section 35 approved body status, something that a lot of your reserves will have, but also the National Trust and the Wildlife Trust and Natural England have. And there are very few private landowners that have that. This is approved body status for... This effectively uh, enables you to have triple SI consent to manage uh, that designation. Just to be clear, yeah, yeah, and uh, actually National Nature Reserves and, as well. And National yeah. Nature Reserve, but the Holcomb Reserve is also SAC, SPA, yeah. Ramsar, uh, multiple designations. So, would I like to oversee the management of that? Uh, would I also like to oversee Holcomb's game management and its forestry, but also its farming and the environment, and try to. Uh, develop new strategies for Holcomb to lead in uh, good good land use, which is something it has a history of doing, going back 200 years and the 
uh, Norfolk four crop rotation. So, and, and so what, which year was this now when you had that conversation with Lord Leicester? So I had the conversation in the summer of uh, 2018. Right. And on the 1st of November, I started working for Holcomb. Um, so that's been a, an honor and a privilege, but it enables me to, uh, in a place with high visitor numbers, uh, amazing nature, uh, that was already good, but actually how can we make it better? And then how can we then talk to others on how we can make it better? So and was there already a decision before you started that they, from Lord Leicester or from, from whoever, that they wanted to, to go to the next level? So I think, so with the, with the 25 year environment plan and we had exited Europe, and the, the transition from agricultural support and how that would go, I think a part of my role was to try to navigate that for Holcomb and looking opportunities. And in the last four and a half years, boy, hasn't that changed. We've got the SFI, Sustainable Farming Incentive, with new uh, options for farmers that have come out literally in the last week. We've got uh, Countryside Stewardship, which has been rebranded as Countryside Stewardship Plus, but it's basically the implementation of environmental goods within within any landscape. It doesn't have to be uh, within the farm landscape. And then we have the third element, which is landscape recovery. So how can Holcomb be lead and be bold and innovative in its land use by producing food, producing nature, uh, and, and engaging with a lot of people, both locally but actually on a national and Possibly, you know, I well, I, we bumped into each other at COP26. Yeah. So, but also on an international level. Yeah. Okay. So you started in the role of, in November 2018. You know, it's your five-year appraisal coming up. Um, what's gone well, Jake? So what's gone well? So we uh, the nature reserve is smashing it out of the park. We are delivering you know, nature conservation. We, I, I look at it in a very different way. It's about a series of processes. Uh, and you start a process and you let, let it evolve. And you might reset that process. Or you, uh, so if I look at a hay meadow, you reset the process of a hay meadow every year. Woodland coppicing, you coppice that every 15 years. So you reset that process. So trying to implement a range of processes. You know, the nature reserve, the designation is just under 10,000 acres. It's enormous. It's got freshwater marshes, reed beds, salt marsh, sand dunes, and pine wood. Um, so you have an opportunity to start a range of processes that are from one year to five years to ten years to a hundred years, and you let that play out. You in, you make a wetland wet, and you know you give them water and they will come. So you know the, one of the key natural capital elements that is so key to biodiversity is fresh, clean water. So we can achieve that, and then you start to see the reactions of your management decisions, and. They've been pretty good, if I'm honest. So we, you know, we brought lapwing populations back to what they were 20 years ago. We've had record populations of breeding avocet uh, and reed bunting. We've seen the spoonbill, Holcomb spoonbill population, which is the biggest breeding population of spoonbill, Eurasian spoonbill in the country. Has, we've seen that population doubled. We've seen Natterjack toad have their biggest spawning year. And Tony Juniper, the chair of Naturalism, came and witnessed 155,000 toadlets. So we, we really can prove we can not only stop decline, but actually we can reverse and we can start setting new records in nature's recovery. So that was the reserve. But also then I look at the farmed landscape. And I think the Holcomb farming team, have all, they were doing some great stuff and they understood about the care and attention to soil. But actually what it lacked was a significant abundance of nature. We then set up a farm which was a 100-hectare farm that had been taken on from a previous tenant. And I think it was described by the farm manager as being farmed hard, short rotation, a lot of root crops, no attention to detail or soil care. Uh, and we looked and we baselined everything to then see how quickly we could create change. Um, so similar, let's look at the uh, farmland breeding bird index, which after woodland has seen some of the biggest declines in the last 70 years. How can we bring some of those farmland birds back? Well, they actually give them what they require because each and every species has a specific requirement. Uh, common blue butterflies love bird's foot trefoil. If you plant bird's foot trefoil, you'll get common blue butterflies. Yellow hammers, a classic farmland bird, the canary of the cornfield, um, likes hedges to be 12 foot high as singing posts. So 
you just stop cutting your hedges. Economically, that's quite efficient because it was costing on that farm over £3,000 to cut the hedges. So we're saving, but actually then we're actually seeing nature's recovery within the farm landscape. Pollinators, big declines. Lots of talk about big declines of pollinators, specifically this year. Probably that's due to the extreme temperatures from last year. But actually, if you give pollinators pollen, it's amazing how quickly they come back. So yeah. when we do the butterfly transects and we do the bee transects, we start to see species that were absent to the farm uh, three years prior. So what it's trying to do is trying to give encouragement to farmers on how they can bring nature back to the farm. But it's not just a, it's not just about that because we you know if I look at the uh, everything that's happening in Eastern Europe currently, and we've seen these huge rise in uh, food inflation but we see talk of self-sufficiency and, um, uh, and food security, we know that we have to produce food. And 70% of England is in agriculture. Different forms of agriculture, but Norfolk specifically is quite a high producer of food. So how can we produce in a food that is less damaging to our environment, that has soils that are resilient? So we look at a lot of the discussions that we've had today and farmers talking about cover crops and catch crops and no-till and, and different methods. What's great about it is the farming community recognise there is a problem. All the, all the stats and all the data have been saying that for quite some time. The State of Nature report, we're expecting that due to come out imminently. I think we're not going to get any surprises what it's going to say because we're still seeing decline. But the farming community, specifically here, are starting to recognise there is a problem. We haven't got all the answers. Government are trying to offer some of the incentives for those changes. Um, but... It's it, what it, what is encouraging and in positive from my perspective is that there is knowledge exchange because that hasn't happened before and the range of different farmers and land managers that I've seen today go from the small owner occupier to a tenant farmer to a large landowner who's got a big agri business and you've got agri business here also learning from what the principles of Regen Ag are. So. That's your description of what's gone well over the last five years for you at Holcomb, but also in the wider debate. Again, five-year appraisal. What's not gone so well? So what's gone, not gone so well is uh, I had a conversation with a, a farm manager the other day, and uh, I said 40% of my job is politics, and he suggested that was 75%. So if we look at Ukraine, if we look at COVID, if we look at the change of language from DEFRA with, you know, we have um, the 40, 42 day trust administration and everything that happened there. We then have, um, we have a, a, a new uh, series of ministers within DEFRA who have different opinions from the previous one. So everything that Michael Gove talked about, which actually I think gave everyone a lot of encouragement, we see this steady change in language and we see the steady change in the, in the, um, in what, what others think we should be doing with our land. There is a lot of demand on our land like never before. There's housing, there's infrastructure, there's carbon, there's, there's food. And I just feel in the last, in the last three years, the, the, the voice of nature feels slightly, it had its front foot forward and it's slightly been put to check in, mm. the, la in the last, specifically the last two years, 18 yeah. months. So, uh, and, but, you know, I, I have two young adults, and I know that things that if the, the things that we have to put in place now needs to be the foundations for the next generation, and we need to navigate through this uh, the, the, these conversations and all of these hurdles that will come up, because fundamentally, for the first time ever, there is a general recognition, uh, uh, backed up by the science, that we are do have climate change, it is going to affect our ability to food, produce food. Nature can have a significant role in addressing that and how we can blend the two together. So the conversations are the, my biggest frustration of the conversations. Yeah, well, let's, let's go into that a little bit more because as you, as you rightly say, particularly I think in the last 18 months, particularly since the start of the war in Ukraine, there's been quite a deliberate attempt by some people in the public policy debate to try and take us back to a conversation about it being food production or nature recovery, suggesting they're kind of very different things and that they're kind of polar opposites and so on. I mean, how does that make you feel? You've been, you've been trying very hard to marry these at Holcomb, and it must have been, 
uh, you know, to see in the national debate it being framed as food or nature, you've got to choose one or the other, as, as it has from some interested parties. So land sharing, land sparing, that debate. Um, and you just need to change the narrative. So I think it went quite nature heavy. Um, so when we had, when, when the other side of the conversation had the opportunity to change the dialogue, they made the most of that. Uh, if we um, if we look at uh, if if we look at the importance of our soils, and soils got a lot of attention recently, but soils will only be resilient if they're fully functioning and they're alive with life, and they will produce food. Um, so, I, I'm of the I'm a land sharer, but actually land sharing. Let's look at Net Castle. From my perspective, that's and a so land. So broadly, I just want to stop just for particularly our, our people watching on social media, might not be quite aware of all the, this debate around land sharing or land sparing. Very shortly, land sharing is about us trying to have sustainable approach on all land, so it's good for food and nature. And land uh, sparing is this argument that we should perhaps really intensify food production in some bits of the country and intensify nature in other bits of the country, broadly, broadly put. So, so carry on, Jake. I just wanted to explain so, that. So I, I'm, of, I'm of the belief that it's got to be land sharing, specifically in the UK. So sustainable everywhere, in other words. Yeah, so because if we then in deeply intensify the fens, which yeah. are it's some of the biggest food production area in, in, within England, um, actually that could have be, be significantly detrimental um, because there's a lot of peat there. Uh, there's We've got sea level rise. So if we put all our... The classic example is of Ukraine. If we put all our eggs in one basket, then they are susceptible, they are hugely vulnerable. So if you have a land sharing model where you can still produce a small amount of food in the uplands, uh, but actually using that food production to enhance nature, very similar to what we do on the nature reserve, the 800 cattle there, it's a working farm, but it's the cattle that are the ones that produce the biodiversity. So that's you know, and then within a more intensive arable operation, there is no reason why every farm in England can't make space for nature at different levels. And when I get asked by farmers, "What do I do?" Well, actually, we can't have a we can't have a it too prescription led, because a farmer in Cumbria or Cornwall or Norfolk or Northumberland will have very different soil types, different topography, um, different rainfall. So it's got to be adaptable, and we've got to understand what works in each area. And that's why event, uh, events like this and others that happen throughout the year actually start to, how do we start to implement that and have, have everything? We can, of course we can have everything. We're, we're uh, you know, hugely intelligent. We have an amazing amount of data available that we never did before. Let's make best use of it, and let's understand, and look at the technology and, and, and look, at the, uh, look at some of the old techniques. So I, you know... When I, sp you know, I've got a friend of my father's who's 96. Uh, he's been farming for 80 years in the same farm. He always sp made space for nature, even when the demands were to plough right up to the headlands. And actually, he has a fully functioning ecosystem, producing food uh, with an abundance of uh, abundance of wildlife that I'd expect to see in that area. But I wouldn't be able to replicate that. He's in North Suffolk on heavy clay. I wouldn't be able to replicate what he does on the North Norfolk coast. So uh, let's just play around with terminology a little bit. I mean, we are here, Groundswell 2023. Uh, it defines itself as the Regenerative Agriculture Festival. What for you is regenerative agriculture, regenerative farming? So that question today, I've heard more than any other. And for me... Yeah, we all seem to have to put labels on everything, whether it's rewilding or regenerative or uh, intensive or com the conventional. This is one of they call conventional farming. What the hell's conventional farming? But actually, I think farming just needs to be uh, needs to be sustainable. In econ economic is really key. Uh, environmental, uh, and those are the three. Uh, and, and and productive. Those are the three key elements of good agriculture. Um, and if we look at the five principles of uh, regenerative agriculture, which are on all of our pamphlets today, 
Um, the one that I feel that is missing, so there's one that's about always a living living plant within the soil, the minimal tillage or as less tillage as possible. Rotation is really important. Having some sort of livestock element is really important. But the one that I think they miss is context because it can't be prescriptive because each farmer needs to evaluate themselves how they do it on their farm. And there are some wonderful examples and the really importance of the knowledge sharing. So actually learning. We made mistakes at Holcomb. We thought we were going to be, you know, we felt the pressures of trying to join this movement. And we did things that actually weren't great, that actually had detrimental effects to subsequent food crops. Um, that, so then if we look at, um, we, we need to know what works for each individual uh, and Getting the, de getting, the, getting the data, understanding, uh, understanding the delivery and your objectives, and setting out a roadmap that is flexible and will change, and new technology will come on. Gene editing. Gene editing has the potential to be a game changer. You know, I've got lots of farmers at the moment. Barley yellow dwarf virus is a, is a, is a, is a virus carried by an aphid. Um, and a lot of farmers have felt the, the, the peer pressure but no insecticide. Great, I love it. I said no inse insecticide is the most bizarre. Um, a broad spectrum insecticide is a bizarre concept. Um, but they've so they've done that because they felt the peer pressure, and then they've seen all of this virus within their crops, which will affect their yield. Um, but actually, uh, if we start to have uh, uh, varieties of cereals that are resistant or tolerant to the virus through gene editing, that's got to be a winner. Um, so that's got to be that's got to be something that uh, uh, we must we must look at technology and adopt it when we feels fit. If we look at organics, so organics, everyone you know, very expensive niche market. Only three percent of British land use is in organic farming. Um, but what we have the opportunity here is, if we don't have anything that's too prescriptive and is adaptable and flexible, regenerative agriculture has the opportunity to deliver significantly and at scale. We see this globally, Australia, uh, North America, some really amazing, innovative farmers working, working in those countries, but, but don't necessarily apply that here, mm. but actually apply something that is suitable to your location. Shouldn't, shouldn't regenerative farming just very simply be a concept of of increasing, ever increasing the inherent ability of the farm to to produce food, uh, minimising the inputs. So it, should it not be that? And then it incorporates a lot of the other things we've been talking about. So we want to so we want to reduce uh, artificial inputs, fertilisers, yeah. fungicides, pesticides. Yeah. Um, we want to look at nature-based solutions in our food production. Uh, Gay Brown, a farmer in North Dakota, a quite a big regenerative farmer. Uh, wrote a book called Dirt to Soil in 2019, and he says there's 35 tons of free nitrogen above every acre in, on, in, the, wor in the world. How can we answer that free ni nitrogen to, to, to grow healthy crops? How can we improve our soil? Any farmer that has plowed a, a, a meadow knows that when, they, when, you, when you turn the soil, when you invert the soil um, and you plow the land, it smells amazing. The smell I can't describe is a fantastic, rich, organic smell. It looks like chocolate. And the first time they put their cereal crop in it, it yields amazingly. And it's disease-free. Can we not learn something from that? Is mm. there something, you know, so that actually there's ability to have that within our rotations? Mm. Um, if I look at, you know, so what everything that I talk about where I'm trying to make space for nature in the farm landscape is all on the edges but it only for it to truly work is it has to happen at a whole farm level. And that's, that's the nirvana. Yeah. I mean, you were talking earlier about Fenlands and Fenland agriculture in particular. You know, on average across the Fens, uh, we're seeing two centimetres of soil being lost every year. It's just ox drying up, oxidising into the air, quite extraordinary. It is extraordinary to think that we've, we've ended up in a situation where the vast majority of agriculture, however you define it, you can't define it as regenerative agriculture. How is it we've ended up here? What, what, and, and, you know, it's kind of... I mean, many of us know the story, but, I mean, when you stand back from it, is it is extraordinary, isn't it? Um, there are approximately four global businesses that, run, that, that feed 30 billion people around the world. 
And those businesses run on, they produce the seed, the fertilizer, the machinery, the supply chains, uh, right, right, through, right through to the, virtually to the shop floor. Um, and they're driven by huge profits. And I think I recently said, suggested it's, it's, it feels like a bit of a cartel. Uh, we also, the policies haven't been right, but the policies have also driven, uh, are driven by others potentially profiteering. And the whole thing seems bizarre when we're trying to feed, if we, you know, uh, I think it was Napoleon that an army feeds, an uh, army marches on its stomach. And actually, when we can produce healthy, nutritious, environmentally friendly food, we're going to have a healthy population. You know, if we look at some of the, there was a recent report the other day that because of the food we're eating, the, the young people's, our brains are shrinking. We're actually becoming unhealthy and we'll become less developed. So I just, I just think that uh, we globally we are driven by profit and capitalism, and actually, and that's been the problem. Perpetual growth is unsustainable, and perpetual degrading of our environment will potentially has the potential to be catastrophic for humanity. And we have this once in a lifetime, once in a generation time, to start the process of change. And I feel I have glimmers, I have glimmers of hope. But occasionally the dark clouds come across. What are those glimmers of hope? The glimmers of hope is the next generation are right up for it. The next generation, all the young farmers and young landowners I meet are really up for it. If government can get the incentives right, if we can get buy-in from corporations globally and we can see the amount of, you know, it's going to cost money, I'm afraid. It's, that's the way the, the world works. It's going to cost money, but it will be money worth, well, worth and well invested because... You know, in by you know the next century, the the world will be un uninhabitable if we carry on this trajectory. So agriculture transition. So it's 2016, uh, the the EU referendum took place. We're now uh, 2023. So uh, what seven years on from that? Is that right? Yes. <laughs> so I had to just think about that for a second. Seven years on. How do you think we're doing in the agricultural transition so far? I mean, if you had to mark out of ten. The, uh, the, the policy intervention has been made. We've obviously had the introduction of the environmental land management schemes and others. How do you think we're doing as a country in, in the transition that was promised? It ain't great, is it? It hasn't been great. The, the, the vision, the 25-year environment plan, the health and harmony paper where government discussed that with all land users. Uh, the published during the while Michael Gove was Secretary of State. Exactly. The, uh, the, the Environment Act, the Agricultural Act, which allowed UK government once removed from Europe to implement uh, its its own uh, uh, food and farming and environmental uh, uh, strategy uh, and and law, um, and it's just you know changes changes in uh, policy makers. So we look at we've uh, we've had three four secretaries of state. There's no continuity there. We have, uh, we, have, um, we have the Descupta review, which looked at how we value nature. There wasn't really a response to that review. That's really powerful, because that determines how much farmers and land managers get paid to deliver the public goods that everyone talked about. So it has been mildly frustrating, but it's mildly frustrating both for the Wildlife Trust, the National Trust, the RSPB, the NFU, the CLA, Everyone has been frustrated in the lack of momentum. And only last week did we feel that actually that momentum moved forward a bit. But, you know, 30 by 30 is very close. Um, farm businesses and food security is a real issue for many. Uh, the lack and loss of nature and the halting of declines, and I think the state of nature will stay, we're still in declines. Um, uh, that's that's not happening. And if you get the policy right, you can accelerate this. So I just urge government, to, to this current administration, to take this really seriously because this will this will affect our health service. This will affect us our education service. This will affect everyone. And it's um we just need uh we need to there to you know, put their front foot forward and start to, you know, and it can be done quite quickly. If you look at one example where the upland farmers felt slightly, um, uh, mildly undervalued because, 
because of the income foregone basis for how much farmers get for delivering public public goods, uh, a lowland farmer who produces more food got £151 for unimproved grassland. That's just species-rich nature grassland to you and I. Um, but the upland farmers who felt they were doing some really great stuff only got a fraction of that. So the government realised there was a bit of a kick-off in the uplands, and the government realised that, and they changed that policy in weeks. So we know they can be, they can be very swift to change, and that's we need them to be flexible. We need to, them to, we need all of us to talk to them and uh, raise the issue with the hurdles that arrived, and get them to to remove remove those barriers to accelerate. And it can do. I, I do have confidence. I've spoken to Defra, two or three individuals today. I feel confidence that they are listening and they're trying to change. But we're all going to see change because within the next 18 months, we're going to have a general election. So I'm going to come on to that. Just to clarify you, something you said, you said 30 by 30 is very close. What you, what you mean, because uh, I heard you say it earlier, you mean 2030 is very close and we've got a long way to go, is what you mean. That's exactly yes, what I mean. Yes. In case, because people might understand it to mean the other thing. We're almost done 30 by 30, but anyway... Um, so, Jake, uh, two final questions. And given you said that at least 40% of your job is politics and, and your neighbour said actually it's 70%, uh, first, question, uh, first final question I want to ask you. We've got probably no more than 18 months, less than that, really, to the next general election and, and realistically 12 months of, at most of sort of functioning government. Uh, what's the, the big thing that you'd really like to see government to do in the next 12 months on this agenda? Uh, <coughs> pay more to farmers. Pay for, recognize when they do good, and pay them for them, and value and, and value the work they do. Pay pay more to farmers to do what though? To, to 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 have better farming systems, to make more space for nature, to encourage the uptake. You can farmers historically throughout throughout time are <coughs> are incentivized through income. If you give them the income, they will create the change. You know, so if we look at arable farmers who are particularly feeling particularly good at the moment because the new sustainable farming incentive standards really favourable favour arable farmers, being paid not to imply insecticides, being paid to have companion cropping, um, we will see we will see the landscape change within the next two years because of those. The, the, the changes in those in those income streams. So does that mean you need to see more standards, uh, a variety of standards in SFI, or more uh, sustainable farming incentive, or does that mean more generous payments for the ones that you already got? So, so, so a bit of both. More standards because uh, so because every farm's different. Uh, a, a guidance rather than prescriptive, right. so so that each farmer can adapt it for their business because every business is different, um, <coughs> and pay them more value it and then my final question is for the next general election if you had to close your eyes what would be the dream thing that you would see written in a party manifesto whichever party at the next general election um, the increase of the ag budget by about a billion pounds so not 2.4 billion but 3.4 billion um, and whether that was for s sustainable food production or uh, Increasing the abundance of nature, you know, the commitment that the government have signed up in Montreal, actually, it's only going to realistically happen if they start paying for it. And some of the parties are indicating that that might increase. So that's that would be my, uh, and I think all of the organisations I've referred to earlier would 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 tend to agree with that. And given the cost we spend on a lot of infrastructure, hundred billion on HS2, for example, finding a one or two billion more for restoring our natural infrastructure seems pretty good value. Exactly, and, and the other one, how many hundreds of millions did we spend on a load of PPE that ended up in a waste bin? So exactly. government can find the money if they really want to. Well, Jake Fines, thank you very much for talking to the Wildlife Trust tonight at Groundswell. Really enjoyed this in conversation with you. Thank you very much. Great you could join us and tell us about the work you've done at Hogan, but also talk about the wider story. Uh, thank you very much. Let's give it up for Jake. And uh, if you enjoyed that watching on the Wildlife Trust social media channels, please do keep your eyes peeled on our channels over the next 24 hours. We'll have many more sessions coming from the Wildlife Trust at Groundswell. Uh, that's it for now. That's it for day one at Groundswell. Thanks so much for joining us. Good night. Good night.